part of Project Tipping Point is just connecting like-minded people so that they can have these relationships that help them embed their new values and behaviours so they're not reverting back to what they know and what they see their peers do and all of a sudden we've lost someone who could have been an in a, an ally and help spread the word. They just they don't want to stand out. They don't want to go against the flow all the time. And if you can protect them by giving them a support network and a cushioning, then they can go on to spread the message to their network. Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Erin Remblantz. Erin is a writer, an activist, and the co-founder of Rebiz, an unschool that offers courses and workshops to connect people from all around the world who want to learn how to respond to the poly crisis. They do this by revealing the current business as usual worldview and offering a new worldview, along with values and behaviors that people can then validate within a community that they also set up. They have a couple of core courses, including Project Tipping Point, which is about how to create social tipping points, which is exactly what Erin joined me to speak about today. We discuss the relationship between power, people, democracy, how we need to get organized, how degrowth policies are an excellent way to get people on board, the importance of democracies or faux democracies, as Erin calls them, how they are threatened, how we may protect them. Erin then talks about how the environmental movement is mostly still about switching technologies, how there's still a lack of understanding about material demands and energy demands of a growing economy, before going on to explain about how mobilizing a movement needs to be around values and behaviors, with Erin revealing the science of social tipping points what they are, how we can achieve them, and giving examples from politics around the world that manage to shift people's worldviews with grassroots organizing and with examples of real leadership. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques, and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Erin, thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really looking forward to to chatting with you. Yeah, me too. I feel like this has been a while on the books. We've sort of been seeing each other from afar and definitely supporting one another's work. So um, I'm just really glad that we finally got around to doing it. Yeah, me too. I think it's going to be fun. So my first question for you is the same question as for everyone else. Why is the world in crisis? Oh, that's a nice big question. Um, (laughs) Look, I think it probably all comes down to power and who has power and what they do with their power. And um, like I think that where we are at this point in time, from where I stand, I don't think there's enough people pushing back on their power. So there's a lot, they're getting away with a lot that they shouldn't be getting away with. Um, And so... Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of work to do to try and organize and um, educate and inspire and help push it back against the the people who have the power at the moment. Mm. You know, I saw something just before we jumped on our call, um, which is that there's a think tank in the United States called Something for Government Accountability. Um, And it's backed by the top 1%. And they are currently funding uh, or behind the recent swathe of anti-universal basic income bills that are hitting state floors in the United States. 
because obviously universal basic income is something that works. It raises quality of life, it improves overall well-being for the community, even improves um, sort of that local GDP. Not that that's a measurement that you and I would use to talk about prosperity. Um, and so, yeah, they're trying to get it banned across the United States. Yeah, and um, like it doesn't it doesn't surprise me one bit. It's like the Atlas Network. Like they literally just exist to <laughs> further their own interests and they are essentially funded by the 1%. So the Atlas Network, for anyone who hasn't heard of them, is like a think tank or a conglomerate of think tanks, a network of think, think tanks or junk tanks, as George Lombio calls them. Um, there's 550 of them in 100 different countries who just exist to to achieve what the people who fund them want to achieve and that's you know basic neoliberal policies like small government free markets um and anything that goes against that like supporting workers um providing people with basic human needs well, they won't support that they will come up against that and we're seeing it over and over again and unfortunately they're very well organized probably much better organized than we are at this point in time so yeah um i feel like we're going to see a lot more of that happening before enough people realize that this is really serious um yeah and that's the same with the sort of protest laws that we're seeing come up like you know for crazy little things like walking slowly that's now illegal and you can go to jail for six months like what mm -hmm. <laughs> how on earth is this possible but mm -hmm. um yeah that is what we're seeing i think the fear though is that by the time enough people wake up to what's happened so many rights will be stripped away that we won't live in democratic societies anymore in order to take action, to push against this kind of power. Yeah, and um, yeah, de definitely time is of the essence. Um, I do feel like there's certain countries where if it ever got to the point where we weren't in democracies, like we would know about it. I think that would be one of the things that would get people on the streets in huge numbers. I think that would really wake people up. Um, but yeah, like, yeah, I, I, that's why I do this work every day as much as I can, because we need to mobilize as quickly as we can. That's, yeah. let's, let's tease that out. The, the democratic nation thing. And if it would wake people up, um, which countries and why, like, yeah. Why do you think that that would sort of be the, the response from the majority of the people? Yeah, so I'm primarily, a lot of my work is focused on the global north over-consuming countries um, and mostly because I feel like they're the countries causing the harm. So when I when I focus on these as being demo, um, democratic nations, it's because we sort of tell each other that these are democracies that we're living in, even though they're really just faux democracies, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Like with all the money that is in um, politics and in Australia and probably lots of other countries, the revolving door between politics and industry and, yeah. um, you know, the way that fossil fuels and lobbyists have access to our members of parliament. There's no way that these are genuine democracies, but there is still a sense because we go and vote every three, four or five years that we're in a democracy and we get to choose our party, um, not necessarily our leader in the case of Australia, um that that that's okay like we're okay with that but i do think if there was ever the sense that we couldn't even do that that people might start to wake up to actually this is this is much worse than i realized but i mean yes but we're kind of already seeing that with like the united states and their dodgy rules around um having to have id in order to vote and in the UK as well, the Tories were trying to use that in different constituencies as a way of like stopping people getting to the polls that were obviously not going to vote for them. So these, like, because this is the thing, it doesn't just happen that one day we all wake up and um, have lost the right to vote. Like these are very, very incremental changes. Um, and I suppose yeah. this is what my fear is, that it's so incremental, kind of like how what Margaret Atwood lays out in The Handmaid's Tale, that by the time we realize, what are we going to be able to do about it? Yeah, I mean, and that, I think it's even it's even deeper in the United States because mm. really you have two parties to choose from, and neither of them really have in, like people or the planet at the heart of their goals and ambitions. So 
um, you know, is it really a democracy if you get to choose from two parties? And, yeah. you know, and especially if neither of those parties, um, if they both take political donations and have lobbyists and, um, you know, they're they're both really neoliberal, aren't they, in what they're seeking to achieve? Um, so, yeah, um, look, there is that issue. I don't, I don't think that even if it happens incrementally and the changes happen so slowly that people don't realise that that will stop people from waking up at one point and then change happening quickly in reverse. Like mm-hmm. I, I still hold that hope that if we have enough people who want good things to happen, then things can happen really quickly. Like you know, change change can happen fast and isn't always linear I guess is Mm -hmm. where I see that going and I I do think that we don't know what the future holds either so um as much as I don't like climate change being on our side it will create these events that make people realize that we're really destroying this climate that has enabled human civilization to flourish and start to understand that. And then and the risk then is that they'll either start to understand the science and the necessary mitigation required on the back of that science, or they'll start to go to authoritarian sort of populist leaders and do exactly the opposite of what's required. Um, both of those are a risk. Um, well, that, that second scenario is a risk. But we, um, but we can, we can do what we can between now and, you know, this scenario in the future to talk to people and and help them understand where we're at and start trying to reach people and using our voice for as much good as we can. So this comes back to your your first point around organizing and trying to get organized and trying to give people an idea of a vision as well of what the future could hold. Like to me, when I think about the future, when I think about a green world, a sustainable world, the first things I think about are like time, having more time and having more time with my loved ones and having more, uh, having access to fresh fruit and fresh vegetables, having uh, a roof over my head that doesn't cost the earth, having just a much, much higher quality of life. And then way down the list is kind of like, yeah, you know, and we get our energy from, you know, something that is an apps like fundamentally polluting and destructive. Um, but I think in the mainstream discourse when people think green they still think windmills and solar panels first right yeah i think so um where i'm at with um i guess the mitigation required to to do what's needed to avoid catastrophic climate change is a lot of my time and energy is focused on degrowth and a lot of the degrowth policies that you'd put forward to get people behind degrowth aren't green energy who cares like honestly who cares where yeah. <laughs> they're like you're saying like it's very low down people's list but the first thing you could do is offer people a three to four day work week yeah or you could offer them a job guarantee or you could offer them universal basic services so um your uh health education um some form of public transport um quotas of energy water internet you know all of these things are possible even you know community gardens all of these sorts of things are possible facilities um you know one of the big things is and this goes back to george monbiot as well but like uh private sufficiency public luxury we could have Mm -hmm. amazing things in the area so that we don't all need i'm in australia backyard pools that use heaps of energy to heat the water and that sort of thing so you can offer people this i think that's way more important than offering people you know community solar or something like that for for a lot of people for many people that is still very important but they're the they're the policy policy leads that you would go with if you're trying to to get people on board I think and absolutely time is important I think that you know I'm just I love memes I think they're so good at describing (laughs) things but there's like a tweet or a meme that says like the both parents weren't ever meant to work 40 hours a week like it was for one person to do while the other person managed the household because it's sort of a big job managing a household and children Mm -hmm. and all of these things and then by the time that's done, you get to the weekend, you can actually enjoy the weekend. But if you're both working a 40 hour or worse, longer week, your weekend then is just doing chores and prepping for the next week. And, you know, where do you fit life in <laughs> on your two slash three slash four weeks of annual leave a year? Like, and then, and then you end up doing high carbon activities because you're desperate to get away and do something and have some fun. Um, whereas, you know, if you're not working as much, you might be okay with a local holiday because a you probably don't have as much money because you're not working as much, but also you just don't have that same need to escape either. Um, 
and get away from it all. So yeah, like I think there's some really interesting policy leads that would tick a lot of people's boxes. Um, yeah, for creating that sort of more beautiful world that we all know is possible, whether we get there. That's another question. I completely agree. I think the first time I spoke to Jason Hickel about degrowth, my mind was just like, you know, like, what? This yeah. is, I want this. <laughs> How can I get this? How can I get this for everyone that I know and love? Like, this is, it's such an amazing vision. It just makes sense as well. Like, it's, you know, why would we grow an economy forever? Mm. It's, it's clearly not possible, especially when you understand the correlation between GDP and energy use and GDP and material throughput. And then the connection between energy use and our ability to decarbonize and the connection between uh, material throughput and biodiversity loss. You know, like here's two of our key planetary boundaries. Can you explain all those throughputs for us? So GDP and energy use, they're like basically a ratio of one to one. So very tightly coupled and can't be decoupled. There's an Australian economist, his name's Stephen Keane, and he says, um, Capital without energy is a statute and the human without energy is a corpse because everything we do in our economy requires energy, whether it's food, whether it's oil, whether it's um, coal burning to create electricity. So that's why you see this sort of chart where GDP and um, energy just uh, go in lockstep and they always will. Like it's very, there is no proof that they can be decoupled. So the challenge then becomes how do you decarbonize an energy grid that's continuing continuing to grow with GDP? So for example, um, a 10 year growth in GDP at roughly 3% each year is, I think it's something like 36 or 37% growth in, a, in that 10 year period. So if you're trying to reduce your emissions by let's say 50%, maybe even 75% if you're an over consuming nation, it's gonna be so much harder if you're using 30, you know, 33 to 37% more or whatever it is um, in 10 years time. Now you're just making that job so much harder. As Jason Hickel says, it's like trying to run up an escalator that's accelerating downwards. Like mm. what, you know, just go down the escalator that's going down and reduce <laughs> how much energy you're using in the first place and you'll get there much quicker. Um, and then, so the link between GDP and material throughput is also pretty much one-to-one. -one. So basically everything we do in the economy, you know, we're pulling fish out of the sea, we're chopping down rainforests, we're pulling up fossil fuels, we're pulling up rare earth minerals. All of these things um, leave an impact and, and affect our biodiversity, first and foremost. So, um, you know, a lot of the research at the moment shows that we are obviously in the sixth mass extinction. Scientists have been saying that. But at this point in time, that's not mostly caused by climate change. Like it certainly will be in the future but at this point in time it's it's caused by land use change and how we're using the land so animal agriculture um yeah logging of rainforests uh, urbanization roads all of those things yeah so and just decarbonizing our energy won't change that yes absolutely um it really is quite funny to think of how sort of boring a political vision of just green energy is, especially when you learn how wrong it is, like how unfeasible it is. And it's like, God, why do people keep banging on about this thing that nobody nobody can get behind? I mean, I interviewed Amy West about recently and she was like, she came out this cracking line at the end. She said, you're never gonna get billions of people out on the street for batteries. Like we just yeah. don't care. <laughs> no, it's not an inspiring enough vision. And especially when, you know, this economic system is harmful, obviously, to the planet, but it's harmful to people too. So mm. you have this leverage point where you can say we can make your life better and yet we don't seem to be using it. And I don't I don't think, um, so I'm just going to refer to Jason Hickel again, <laughs> but he, he calls it a lack of radical analysis in the environmental movement that is realising that at the heart of this problem is, you know, the endless growth required of a capitalist economic system. And so because the environmental movement, it's still very much about switching technologies, mostly, mm. um, that it hasn't, it has failed to inspire enough people at this point. Um, and so when you go, well, actually, if we can make people's lives better, and I'm talking global south and global north countries, let's do that. And then, and then we'll improve the planet at the same time. And I think that's a vision people can get behind. You know, I... About once a month, um, I have a very serious want wonder about 
to which point the environmental movements have been infiltrated or will infiltrated from the very beginning because we know that they that were in sort of like the 70s um by police forces around the world we know that the cia has a very very long history of infiltrating whatever the fuck it wants in order to get its way mm -hmm. um yep. and so the lack of cohesion the lack of vision sort of the the poor strategy um, that I think has come out of different pockets of environmentalism and certainly this thing that we cannot seem to get past this point of switching renewable technologies um, is I wonder w was there an infiltration that happened even uh, even when it comes to the focusing on non-violence as a political strategy when the state mm. is using violence against us as a movement mm. I often wonder if that's sort of um, an infiltration as well yeah, look, I wouldn't put it past these, you know, these powers, I guess, going back to the start of our conversation. Um, what I'd seen prior to you just mentioning what you mentioned was that people tried to get inside the system and green it from the inside with mm. the theory being that, you know, this is, we're going to create change from the inside and, and that's how we'll do it. So, you know, instead of pushing it back against global corporations, you go and work in the corporations and try and green them. And, you know, all well-intentioned. Um, but I, I, um, was listening to your podcast with George Monbiot and it might've been that, or it might've been something of his that I read, but he was like, you know, this, this idea of incrementalism in the environmental movement, it doesn't work. Yeah. A, it doesn't work because it's not enough. And B, it doesn't work because it doesn't inspire people. And so, yeah. you know, like it does, it's just not garnering enough support. Um, but as you say, regarding the CIA and, and others, like it's, the thing that keeps me up at night. It's like we could get everyone on board and then they could use, you know, the violence that they're not afraid to use against, you know, us. So, um, and I can, my my only thought on what we do about that is we we get the numbers to change the, the people in power. And I, I, I'm not even sure if that's the right solution, but I do know that it starts with more people being aware and and creating movements and and so that's where my work is centered but it's a, it's a massive risk i agree i think it's very important when we're thinking about what's going on today as well to be very particular with our language and to talk about state violence as as it is happening like yeah. the will it, yeah. the willingness to lock up protesters for or people even for walking slowly as you say that is a form of violence there's no way around yeah. it even frankly yeah. sort of the prison system itself uh, the state being able to lock people away is a form of violence um and i think that having a clearer understanding within the the general public of the injustice of that and the dangers of yeah. that as states continue to sort of wield and abuse more and more power, um, I think is critical at this juncture. I mean, listen, this is like the year of elections all over the world. And I was speaking to an environmental journalist off the record recently, and they were saying, you know, in November when the US election happens, he thinks that it's gonna be Trump either way, because either Trump's gonna win because Biden is really, really, really screwed up on Israel um, mm -hmm. or uh, Biden's going to win, but Trump's going to claim he's won the election and all of these militias are going to go out and the Democrats are going to be faced with, well, we, do we use the military against, do we deploy the American military against the American people or do we hand mm -hmm. over? Mm -hmm. It's 2024. What? <sighs> How? Mm -hmm. And yet, if you've been paying attention, like... I mean, he said it, I was horrified. And I was like, it makes sense. If you look at the trajectory mm. of how much violence has been deployed in the global North in recent years against their own citizens, it is not mm. a wild leap of the imagination by any stretch. And we're doing ourselves a disservice mm. to think that that could never happen here again. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I I never thought January 6th could happen. So right. now that I know that it can, like you wouldn't put it past Trump and, and this and his supporters. So that would be a sad state of affairs. But I'm I'm genuinely not sure if there's, I don't know, is, is Trump better than Biden? I don't know. Like mm -hmm. if you're actively supporting genocide and making excuses for it, like are you really going to do what's required and from a, from a climate point of view? And I, 
I don't know. I'm, uh, yeah, I remember when uh, Trump got elected, when he beat Hillary in 2016, Greta Thunberg woke up and she goes, oh, well, you know, maybe people will realise this is how bad it is and it might wake a few people up. Like mm. part of me is like if Trump wins again, maybe people start to realise that actually things are really bad and democracy is not a spectator sport and they need to get out and help. You know, like some, I, I sort of think things are going to get quite bad before they get better and so mm -hmm. if they're quite bad, you know, like I obviously I'm not, I'm not condoning violence or anyone getting hurt, but if we can do that quite bad quickly, then we can save things even quicker is a little mm -hmm. bit of my thought process because there is, you know, climate tipping points and things that we won't be able to save if, if this takes a long time. Um, so, but yes, I do think Biden has messed up Israel big time. Yeah. Hugely, shockingly. So actually all of them from both sides of the aisle and it's really interesting funny and like, not funny, but interesting in a sort of globalized world to now see, you know, Trump's America first policies is like, huh, well, at least he's a bit hands off, I guess. A disaster is a disaster for the United States. Um, and he's a disaster for business as usual, but he's not big on throwing his military at sort of other people's conflicts. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he might have even, yeah, he might have stopped, you know, sending military, you know, money and and um, arms and things over there. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I suppose the whole episode's been really interesting for me because um, at the same time as I was learning more about imperialism, I was seeing it happen in front of us, you know, literally yeah. coming up on my news feeds and going, oh, it's, it's not over. You know, this imperialism still exists and, you know, creating the regime that suits, protects our interests and these sorts of things that the leaders use, it's still happening. And I see it a lot um, in the courses that we run where people start to understand how harmful the IMF and the World Bank are and the harm that they're causing to Global South countries and the arrangements by which they exist and how uneven their um, constituency is and the, and the sort of binding laws or whatever it might be called in those organizations how unequal the power structures are there and they their eyes just open up to actually the world we live in has been designed in a very in a way that suits the global north and and you know the people in power in the global north and the elites i guess and and the more we can do of that and helping people to understand how the world works i think is the work that needs to be done Let's talk about how we get organized. Let's talk about these courses and how people respond to them. What do you see is the tipping point when you're speaking to, to people typically? Like, how long does it take? Is there a particular messaging strategy? Does it have to be face-to-face? -face? Does it have to be over a period of time? Is there a particular fact or story that gets people sort of wound up enough um, to join? <laughs> Yeah, um, so um, I was interested in social tipping points. I've been interested in them for uh, several years, but it, my interest did begin with George Monbiot and he was on your podcast and, and talking about social tipping points. So sort of leaning on a lot of his work, I started looking into them further and there are things we can do that will help us reach a social tipping point even sooner. And and this social tipping point, it's just the point where you reach a, crit a critical mass where you know, now it really feels like we're pushing a boulder up a hill, like trying to get people involved and engaged and understanding what we're doing. But, you know, the theory being you reach the, reach a peak and then it just um, it's just rolls down the hill and everything's much easier. And that's the point where, um, you know, people's the status quo starts to change and people then start to change their views in line with this new status quo. And, you know, for an example is, um, the legislation of gay marriage and how people who previously thought that they, um, well, who were previously against it, didn't even remember being opposed to it once they switched sides. You know, it's this idea that they've just changed and they've got no memory of being different. And so we're trying to embed new values and behaviors in people and starting to help them see that, uh, you know, the whole world economy needs restructuring and we all need to be involved and a part of that. So, yeah, like in the courses that we run, we've got to um, one's project tipping point and that's, you know, very um, sort of aimed at getting lots of people on board because, you you know, very crudely we're not going to hit a tipping point without lots of people being involved. Um, 
And so it's, you know, trying to reach people in all different countries. We run three different breakout groups for um, Australia time zone, roughly Australia time zone, um, Europe and then the US. And um, and through that process, we want people to meet other like-minded people because step one of being able to cre- to reach a tipping point is to um, protect our first movers. So like, you know, I suspect you, like me, have a group of friends who are very like-minded to you. Um, and um, I have this group and I've mentioned them on a few podcasts and they know I mentioned them because they're one of the few people who actually listen to my podcast. Like my, <laughs> my, my friends and my family don't listen, but my little climate or um, yeah, ecological crisis sort of group, they do listen. And, and they're there. I reckon we speak every day. Just like on Signal, never face to face. We're all in different parts of the country, but they help me learn more and feel not alone and support me. And um, hopefully, I do the same for them. And so, part of Project Tipping Point is just connecting like minded people so that they can have these relationships that help them embed their new values and behaviors. So they're not reverting back to what they know and what they see their peers do. And all of a sudden, we've lost someone who could have been an in a, an ally and help spread the word they're just they don't want to stand out they don't want to go against the flow all the time and if you can protect them by giving them a support network and a cushioning then they can go on to spread the message to their networks so that's sort of step one in creating a social tipping point um it's all very interesting actually when you start to learn about it um <laughs> there's this idea that we just need to reach influencers and you know if we can get someone who's got a hundred thousand followers and they spread the message you know that'll be so good but um, and a lot of my research is leaning on the work of Damon Santola, who's written a book called, mm, I think it's just called Change. I'll find out and confirm. Um, and he's saying it's, influencers aren't going to do it. They've got too many countervailing forces around them because they have such a big network that what will happen is a movement will get so big that they can't ignore it and then they'll take it up but they're not going to be the people who spread the word in the first place. So um, actually change happens in the periphery. It's like the people who have their network reach um, the people closest to them and then hopefully they spread the word and reach the people closest to them and and that's the sort of idea behind creating a snowball effect. Um, and so actually it's everyday people like you and me who have this ability to create change and we don't need to wait for influencers which is wonderful news actually because if you think about it on balance the influencers are probably not wanting to see you know a whole new economic system <laughs> created you know like yeah, there's a few of them but you know if you had to put them on a scale the ones who just want to see business as usual and you know continuous economic growth or whatever they're just going to tip the scale right down because there's so many of them but we can reach the people in our sphere and they can reach the people in their sphere and until it creates momentum um so that's that's sort of a couple of elements, but another one I find really interesting is that um, a movement gets credibility not just by seeing it a lot of times. So if something comes up in your news feed ten times, that's interesting. But if it comes up ten times from ten different people, now it's really interesting. And if it comes up ten times by ten different people who have ten different professions and quite varied professions, now I'm really interested. Like this mm. gives the movement credibility. So. You know, I am a, essentially like an activist and um, a researcher and a writer and a lot of times just a stay-at-home mum. But if um, I see an engineer or a doctor, the theory is that um, supporting a cause as well as, you know, other parents or activists, now I'm really interested because this cause has garnered support from a lot of people, not just the one niche. So it's about how many times you see it how many different people do it and also the sort of how varied those people are that you see supporting a cause. And that's where the status quo changes. Now you're like, oh, I'm on board. <laughs> I get it. And um, and there's, just tell me when to stop if I'm going on too No, please too keep much going. I'm this. fascinated. <laughs> it's super interesting. So um, there's a lot of research to say that there's two types of uh, contag- uh, contagion. So there's a simple one, which is like news or gossip or... Uh, I don't know, um, that's sort of the research around six degrees of separation. Very simple contagions, very easy. Your network is your network. And um, in that inf- in that instance, an influencer is quite powerful. Um, but the second type of contagion is a complex contagion. And, um, and that is where we're trying to change something much more complex. 
hence the term, um, <laughs> then simply, <laughs> simply like uh, gossip or news or, uh, um, you know, a, a new type of fashion or whatever it might be. This is something we're trying to change people's values, people's behaviors, things that are deeply held inside of them. And so where, um, where it might seem wasteful and, and um, uh, contagious diseases are an example of a simple contagion where it just takes transmission from one person to another for that disease to spread. And sometimes mm. I think we think movements are like that. Actually, that's n- not how what we're trying to do spreads. And the more people we see do something, which in a simple contagion scenario would be called a redundancy or a waste because we don't need more than one person to spread our disease, news, gossip, fashion, whatever it is, when we're trying to change values and behaviours, we do. Like we're not just going to see one person start to care about the environment for us to start to care about the environment. But if I see 10 people start to do it, now I'm like, oh, this is the co- like this is the cool thing to do. This is <laughs> we probably won't be so flippant about it, but we'll go. Oh, actually, there's something here, and I want to understand more. And also, I don't want to feel left out. Like you know, we're we're social creatures, and we want to. If everyone at school yard, I'm obviously a mother, is all the parents are talking about uh, COP28, which they weren't, by the way, then I want to understand what's happening at COP28 so I can have that conversation. Um, and so yeah, it's about. That redundancy is actually really critical to a complex contagion catching on and um, and then going forward. Um, so yeah, there's and there's probably it's probably a bit more. Oh, I've got more. Yeah, please. <laughs> if you're interested, <laughs> <laughs> this is Damon Santola's work, by the way. Um, I'm sure I think his books changed. I should have confirmed. It's I'll find out. And let you know. Um, Thank you. But he talks about wide bridges being really important. So. Um, you know, where we're connected to others, and this is more specifically related to organizations, I guess, but organizations who can, you know, uh, incubate a new value or behavior can then help trans transmit that new value or behavior to different organizations. And this is something that we saw during Black Lives Matter by having wide bridges, which is lots of people in one organization being connected to lots of people in another organization and having that um, sense of trust and intimacy and also reputational risk. Because if you know that other people in that organization know you and know your uh, colleagues or whatever it might be, you're not going to do something that's going to give you a bad reputation. So you have this sort of trust and respect for each other and that helps transfer values and behaviors across organizations. So that's a wide bridge and and the opposite of a wide bridge, which would be a narrow bridge where just one person from an organization is connected to just one person from another organization. And in that instance, it's okay for a simple contagion, you know, virus, (laughs) news, fashion, Mm -hmm. gossip, whatever, that can transfer through organizations, but it's not going to be how you transfer values and behaviors. And these deep-seated worldview type beliefs, you need to have lots of connections through organizations. And this always actually comes back to, are we talking to people? <laughs> are we um, are we creating relationships? Are we sharing our concerns? Are we sharing our values and beliefs with people? Like it's, there's a sense that, oh, it's a very big sense that we can't talk politics. You know, that's a rude thing to do. But actually, why not? You know, like this is really important. Um, and I'm, you know, I think you probably have to be mindful of the way in which you do it. But um, it, one of the most important things we could do is to talk about this. Um, and you know, endless growth, consumerism, capitalism, all of it—it's all tied together. Imperialism. Please talk about imperialism. I think that's, you know, I think we're starting to get comfortable. Uh, we're talking about excess consumerism and capitalism, but. Even imperialism, like that's the big one that people I don't think have connected the dots with so much yet. Um, and so the more we do that, the more we can, I don't like the word influence so much, so I'm trying to find a word that's not influence, but like help people understand where we are and why we are here and, and what we can do from there. That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I took so many notes. It's got on a roll. <laughs> oh, it's just super fascinating. And, the, and these are from examples where we've seen social tipping points activated in the past. So the idea that I am um, uh, that we're not all studying this and trying to understand how to get there quicker um, in this instance, I think it's such a big part of the puzzle, and so why I'm you know so passionate about 
talking about it, I think you probably hear the passion in my voice, <laughs> um, is because it's really important. Like if we really want to do what's needed to keep the planet habitable, then then there's research that says how to do it and and what we can do to make it more likely. Um, I reckon I reckon I've given you like the twenty percent of what's in our course. This is this is the fundamental thing. Like, how do we get organized um, in the in the movement or on the left or whatever way you want to identify the the people that are concerned about the world um, and concerned about it because it's not going well enough for enough people, rather than it's not going well enough for a small set of people. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I agree with you that there's a huge amount of literature out here on this. There's a huge amount of research. There's a huge amount of experimentation that's been happening for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years on how to get organized. Um, and the there seems to be a sort of pervasive belief that like we can't, like this is just sort of our fundamental problem and this is why we never get power. That's not helpful. I do think though there is something in like that the left needs to tackle an understanding, well, how does a project that is inherently anti-imperial, anti-growth um, and anti-power take power in order to do what needs to be done? So um, I so this is uh, some information from the Australian federal election back in 2022 and I um, just found myself rereading it before we spoke today because I just thought it was really interesting um look basically at what you've just asked me um at that time we'd had like a conservative government for nine years and and things weren't looking good and so and we'd lost the the climate change election in 2019 to this same government who'd been in power for far too long and so literally in 2019 people started organizing in preparation for the 2022 election and here's some really cool things that i thought was really interesting um the woman who, who won the Victorian seat of Kuyong, her name was Monique Ryan, she's a doctor. She won from the treasurer who, um, Josh Frydenberg, who was everyone thought would be the next leader of the Liberal National Party. Um, so he lost his seat in that election and he had more money than she had. He had a lot more um, uh, money to spend on the election, but she had 2,000 volunteers from her like election area whatever. And, um, and they knocked on all 55,000 doors in preparation for that election. And she won the seat off him. She was an independent. She wasn't associated with any major party. Um, and in that election, independents went from three seats in Australia to 10 seats, a lot of them mm. being part of this sort of Teals movement. So what she did was replicated in, I think, six other seats. And one of them was a different sort of independent, but this Teals, um, they, they, they were just called the Teals, um, which I guess was a little bit of environmentalism, uh, maybe with some conservative policies um, because they were winning in what were otherwise conservative seats. So they were sort of trying to match their electorate. But they had very strong ambition on climate change because they, they, were, they were aware that it was a big deal. Um, and the other one I thought was really interesting was um, in that same election, the Greens increased from one to four seats um, and... I'm just reading something here. It says the best way to persuade voters is to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. And some of the Greens um, candidates have not stopped door knocking since the last election. So um, Matthew Chandler Mather, who won one of the seats, Griffith, Griffith I think, he knocked on 90,000 doors in 14 months. Um, so he wow. was just determined to organize. And in that, um, and he switched a conservative seat to being a green seat. There were two examples of a conservative seat, not just going to a left wing seat, but to like a, a green seat, not just the Labour Party, but to the Greens. Um, and he said he just became a permanent fixture in that electorate. He was helping if there was a flood, he was sending out newsletters, he was establishing community gardens, he was acting like the incumbent, but and, and just showing leadership. But um, so it goes to show that there's this idea that we can't move people, you sort of either right or you're left. And there's a set of people in between who might, you know, you swing voters and otherwise everything's stuck in place. But I don't think that's necessarily the case. I think that if we can reach people and genuinely listen to them and show leadership and that we have good intentions and, and find out what it is that's worrying them, which are often things that can be solved with the policies that we've got um, in our, um, our toolbox, then we can, 
we, you know, we can do good things. So I know there's a seat in the UK, I think it's in East Anglia, that's just had, it might be a council area, had the first green win. So, you know, like these are examples of where we can politically organise and do what's required. But it always, I think, comes back to talking <laughs> and um, and listening and hearing what people want and treating um, people as humans, you know, rather than someone on the left or someone on the right. You know, these these notions and these labels can sometimes get in the way of just having a really good conversation with people. Um, so yeah, I thought that was, I thought that was really cool. And I'd love to see more of it. I'm sure there's some good examples. I'm not across them, but in the U S of different places, like I think Atlanta, they'd had some really good examples of organizing and door knocking and, um, that sort of thing to get, uh, their preferred candidate across the line. I'm sure there's lots of examples of it. So that's happening. That's possible. Door knocking, uh, engaging with the community, meeting people face to face, hearing them really, really listening. Um, I was in a, I did a class recently for journalism students and one of them asked me about like how to do field work and how to sort of be aware of like that power imbalance as somebody who's like coming in to extract information from people. And I was like, just be a good human. It's really not <laughs> that difficult. <laughs> like, listen, <laughs> don't yeah. just, like, don't just go in to get the story that you want. Also go in to listen to the stories that they want to tell you. People typically love sharing their stories. We are a storied species. Um, yeah. So stories have a huge amount of power. It speaks to people face to face as a huge amount of power. I suppose what I'm interested in is coupling what you just said with what we said, we're talking earlier about incremental change in existing institutions. Yeah. So these candidates um, that are being elected or even parties that are being elected that um, would suggest change, but have to do it within the same existing power structures, have to do it within the same institutions. What are they going to be able to do in time, essentially, without being viciously undermined um, or without being, um, how do I put this? Well, <laughs> I suppose this is a difficult thing about politics, right? If you have a radical vision, nobody's going to vote for you because they don't believe you. Um, <laughs> but if you get in and you only do incremental change, then it's it's not going to do anything. Yeah, look, I I would hope that le leadership plays a role here. So um, you're in Greece, I'm in Australia. Did your prime minister, when the um, IPCC uh sixth re working report, whatever it's called, came out, did they stand up and talk to the nation about what was in the report and how dire things were and, and what was going to change based on the report? Mm -mm, yeah, no. like neither did mine, didn't mention it. You know, it's as if it was another day, even though the scientists had spent six years working on it, every government in the world had to sign it off. It comes out and they literally pretend it hasn't happened. Yeah. So, you know, if, if you're, when we had COVID, <laughs> that was very different. Like the prime ministers were up and um, they were having press conferences regularly and then our state premiers were doing them daily in most states and it was at 11 o'clock. We all knew to watch the TV because we want to see what the premier had to say. Whereas we're treating this ecological crisis, so we're just trying to sweep it under the rug and pretend it's not happening. Not me, the leaders, the <laughs> leaders, I put in <laughs> quotation marks. So if they actually showed some leadership, and we had a prime minister back in the 80s, Bob Hawke, who did try and do that. Uh, he had some faults, but he did try and show some leadership on this issue. Then, then it's harder to undermine it because actually there's so much science that supports it. The government's talking the truth. They could have some experts behind them. And now all of a sudden you're starting to get people realizing that this is a big deal because actually they're trying to implement things that are quite radical, but there must be a reason for it. Um, and, you know, like change has happened very quickly in the past. COVID is a recent example of it where we shut down. I, If you ask me in January of 2020 if we'd shut down international travel for, you know, what was it, 12 months? I don't know. I would have laughed. Okay. But that's essentially what we did. You know, if kids would be home from school for months on end, you know, people working from home, like massive change is possible. Um, and not that I'm advocating for the changes we had to have because of COVID, but in, in, as we were mentioning earlier, some of the changes required to get back within planetary boundaries can be good for people. Mm -hmm. You know, we could have time. <laughs> we could have better food. We could have more connected communities. Like I don't think anyone thinks that 
having a second fancier car is the pinnacle of achievement. Well, to be fair, maybe some people do, but you know, like I would rather spend time with my children or uh, spend time with my family or, uh, you know, all of these things, or even have time to develop skills or I love reading. I never have enough time to read. All of these things that we don't have time for because we're so busy just on the rat race, you know, like just trying Mm -hmm. to run uh, to keep up, I guess. Um, So did that answer your question? Um, Yeah. I, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I I think so. I think so in the sense of it's very important to keep in mind historical precedent and very recent examples of when big change has happened um, and not just fall into the thinking of, well, it couldn't because it's environmental or it couldn't like we, there is no way to tell, as you said earlier, what the future holds. Um, I do think that there's just a balance between like keeping a realistic eye on the target, which also means using historical precedent, recent historical precedent as a good example of what can be achieved, um, but also means that we do not accept incremental change um, and consider the, the deeply embedded flaws of our institutions and how some of them might be just fundamentally unable to meet this crisis. Yeah, and you know what we're what we're talking about is pretty, you know, it's a lot of change, and that's because we've not only actively done nothing for nearly four decades, mm-hmm. we've actively actively made it worse. You know, like sixty okay. percent of emissions have happened since nineteen ninety one or something. Uh, no, sorry, we're putting sixty percent more greenhouse gases into the atmosphere than you know, at the Rio Earth Summit in the early 90s. And and now, since that date, we've put more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere than all of human history prior. Like, what well, business as usual is um, is a death march. You know, that's another Hickel <laughs> quote, but, like, it is it's fast-tracking us into mass extinction. So to undo that, not only the business as usual framework but also the four decades of making things worse it it does mean radical change um and you know it's not all bad but a lot of it is just getting used to that idea of change and that tomorrow doesn't look like today that's really hard for a lot of people to come to terms with and and to face into yeah there is this sort of guy there's a guy i follow um he has just been trying to spread the degrowth word for maybe a decade his name's kirk hall uh, he's on Facebook and he sort of says maybe it, it, two medium-sized countries coming out at the same time and just saying what I was saying earlier about leadership and just saying, you know, perhaps in six months' time I'll hold an election, but in the next six months we're going to educate the population on where we are and why we're here and what steps we could take to um, to mitigate this scenario. And, you know, you could use your uh, um, publicly owned uh, media um, channels to communicate this message and you could say look it's still a democracy in six months you guys can decide what we're going to do here but them coming out that would cascade around the world like if mm-hmm. there were a couple of prime ministers who were willing to go I'm not cool with where we are you know breaching six of nine planetary boundaries on my watch is not what I want to be doing here um, you know we're living as if we have 4.5 planet earths like yeah. surely no one thinks that that is sustainable um, you know maybe that's yeah, that who knows what trajectory that would set us off on. It's real leadership, isn't it? Yeah, it's real leadership. And it's that, you know, like that um, ability to forego one's own um, rewards or, you know, sense of purpose and meaning (laughs) because they've put the greater good ahead of their own career path or uh, leadership position. Like they they know they might not get reelected in six months' time, but even if they didn't, that period of time where they just said to their population, this is as bad as people have been saying, but we've been pretending it's not, that could have profound impact, you know, and it could inspire other leaders to do something similar um, who've been too scared to. Um, I just, and it's a scenario that I like to think about sometimes when you feel like nothing's ever going to change. <laughs> <laughs> Things are always changing. Things are so different that they were a couple of years ago. We will. Yeah. And also, I think something that is both deeply frightening and deeply relieving is that even business as usual cannot continue. Like, that's what the climate crisis is. That's what oil depletion is. 
that's what you know increasing you know geopolitical tensions is we're we've moved out of the age of neoliberal capitalism and we're into like some really terrible you know hyper consumerist funding state capitalism resource war scarcity mindset um period but the few like 10 years is gonna look very different tonight no matter what happens yeah yeah and i think um i see some people commenting things like degrowth is coming whether people like it or not yeah sort of like well that technically it's not because that wouldn't be degrowth that would be collapse Mm. but like literally that's the point where we're at like we, the future doesn't look like today. Um, the future looks like collapse. Or if we're smart and um, wise enough, we can plan a, a different scenario that's not collapse. But it means us being forward thinking and, you know, sacrificing some of those things that we always thought were important to put things that are genuinely important and to prioritize those, like keeping the planet habitable, you know, making sure there's enough food in the future for our children and and people who exist already. I always get in this trap of talking about future generations and I know there's people suffering in the global south already who don't have enough food. You know, all of these things mean putting others ahead of ourselves sometimes, well, you know, in in order to achieve a better outcome for the whole planet. Erin, I think that's... Um... I think that's where we should end today. Thank you so much for your time. This has been so enlightening. Really, really great. Thank you. No, a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. My final question for you is who would you like yes. to platform? Oh, oh, I've already told you this one. Um, Chris Decker. he runs Low Tech Magazine and he is a phenomena and I would listen to everything he said forever. Um, he's amazing. He's he isn't explicitly degrowth, but he is degrowth aligned, and he's trying to he imagine what degrowth looks like in practice. And it's really fascinating to see what degrowth looks like in in practice. So yeah, he's he's my platform. Great, my person. Can we speak with him? Thank you so much, Erin. <laughs> a pleasure. Thank you. If you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here, and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com, where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.